All right. <laughs> hey, <laughs> how are you? I'm doing well, my friend. I'm doing well. How are you? Good, good, man. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. How's your week been going? It's been going. <laughs> you know, I think uh, pre-pandemic, my motto was we have to thrive and not survive. Uh, but right now, I, um, I'm pretty okay with surviving. Amazing, amazing. I uh, love your shirt, by the way. Thank you. Yes, Black Votes Matter, you know? <laughs> amazing. Uh, uh, was that something you purchased or was it a gift? Yeah, I purchased it. You know, it, it was uh, something I saw online and was like, you know, uh, this is important. It's uh, important to what I do, to who I am as a person. And, uh, you know, I, I'm all about statement attire, you know, statement T-shirts, statement hoodies. Uh, you know, um, one that I have that I really like just says feminist on it. And uh, I wear it around. Uh, dudes always give me a look and I'm like, that's what I am. You know, you can't, you can't deny who you are. And if you believe in social justice, then you shouldn't be afraid to make people uncomfortable, you know? Right, right. And it, it provokes uh, necessary conversation around topics totally. that we just don't embrace or we just don't have the liberty sometimes to, come, to kind of come across. Exactly, exactly. So that's amazing. Uh, well, I'm excited about this conversation. Oh, let me also shout out this shirt. I just uh, purchased it. It's, what does it uh, say? From, it's, uh, it says, keep going up. All right, I love that. And my friend Brandon Nespong actually started it. Uh, amazing guy, uh, black owned small business. Uh, he just launched it. So I think if you are interested in this shirt or other of his products, you can go to keepgoingup.com. Uh, he's doing some phenomenal work. So we're definitely supporting black businesses and especially during this time. Uh, oh, we, you know, speaking, of of, uh, speaking of that, I want to uh, do a little product placement here for <laughs> uh, my Ground Zero coffee, you know? So just. <laughs> there little... it is. <laughs> little little product placement there, and I I got my Elizabeth Warren mug here. You know she she's still my senator. You know although she's uh, won't be a, the United States president, she still is uh, my Massachusetts senator. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Yeah, well we're looking good on all fronts. We we got the attire, we have the coffee, we mm -hmm. have the mugs. Uh, let's get into some great conversations, which I'm sure we're all looking forward to uh, this afternoon. So. Um, just to give everyone some context into this conversation. First of all, thank you all for tuning in uh, this afternoon. There's so much going on in our world today. So our hope once again is to provide a safe space where we can have meaningful dialogue and talk about a lot of the issues that we are um, seeing through the media outlets, through social media that we're talking about within our own homes with family members, friends, cousins, the, all across the, the world right now. There is, uh, we're in the midst of a, a huge pandemic uh, as well as dealing with um, the murder of George Floyd and racial injustice, racism, protesting, uh, riots, looting, uh, police brutality. It's a lot. And I'm not going to lie, Samuel, like it's been a lot for me to process this because, you know, being black in America, I think that yeah. racism is multi-layered and the weight of racism is heavy because it's something that you have to experience. It's something that you have to express and it's something you have to explain over and over and over again and i think that's the the weight that we're feeling and why it's so heavy because it's one thing navigating it but then it's expressing and explaining it that's also just very tiring and and very um it, it's, it's dehumanizing so it's a lot going on and um and so i hope that this could be conversations where we look at what's taking place right now with the protesting even as we're speaking, uh, the Ahmad uh, Arbery hearing is happening. And I've been trying to catch some information as much as I can. But again, information travels so fast and things change so faster. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's almost like, um, you know, this conversation could be going in a different direction depending on how this hearing goes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's a lot right now just to give you, to give everyone some context of what I've been going through and just trying to process and progress at the same time uh, heal and then help at the same time. It seems like a lot of things are simultaneous uh, within everything that we're going through. So um, to give everyone context, once again, we're going to have this conversation. It's going to be a great conversation. Looking forward to it. After the conversation, we'll jump right into a Q&A uh, with Samuel. So feel free to add comments in the comment section or hold your questions till the very end. And we'll both be able to kind of dive into um, Q&A. So be sure to do that. We'll do that towards the end and have closing statements. But that's kind of an overarching idea of the program. Uh, before we jump right into the show as well, I wanted to give a big shout out to 
uh, the producers of this program, Ground Zero Coffee. Now, Ground Zero Coffee is um, a coffee company that me and a good friend started. There it is. <laughs> You'll show them the, the brand. Make sure you grab a coffee. Uh, but Ground Zero Coffee is East African coffee home delivery company and podcast service focused on community impact through storytelling and social enterprise. We serve specialty grade and ethically traded coffee sourced from its place of origin, Ethiopia, and the greater East African regions. We are coffee focused, community driven, and African sourced. From our Ground Zero podcast service to our community based initiatives, our goal is to improve lives within our community through education, resources, and access for all. And now all proceeds from your Ground Zero Coffee purchase uh, help fuel our commitment to impact our community worldwide. Uh, so this is an exciting thing. This even session is fueled by Ground Zero and the purchases being made allows us to keep going. So thank you all for being an amazing uh, group of coffee lovers and supporters and, um, and, and, and being involved within the community impact that we are making together. So thank you all. Now, before I also jump into this conversation, I wanted to kind of give everyone an idea of who this person is that I'm speaking with today. Uh, really excited about it. Samuel M. Gabru is an Ethiopian American social entrepreneur, community organizer, and consultant. Born in Sudan to Ethiopian parents, Samuel moved to the United States at the age of three in 1995 and was raised by a single mother in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He discovered the voc his vocation for public service as a 13-year-old bringing attention to maternal health issues and raising funds for women suffering from obstetric fistula in, this, in his native country, Ethiopia. Samuel is currently the Massachusetts Development and Partnerships Manager at Generation Citizen and serves as the manager, Managing Director of Black Line Strategies. He sits on Just the Start Corporation's Board of Directors, City of Cambridge City Managers Advisory Committee, Jewish Alliance for Law and Social Actions Advisory Board, and on the Community advisory board of the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research at Harvard Medical School and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. So uh, if you want to know more information about his work and his life, you can definitely go to his website. It's at smgebru.com. That's smgebru.com. Once again, Samuel, thank you so much for being on this program this, uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Nate. It's an honor to have this conversation with you. I've been a big fan of yours for years, as you know, and so uh, having this chance to to virtually have coffee with you and to, to talk about all things social justice. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really my pleasure. Yes, yes, and, and likewise, I love all the work that you're doing. So um, first off, before we even jump into the issues, how have you been processing the racial injustice, the murder of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, um, just as a whole, as a person, how, how have you yeah. been able to process this? You know, um, that, that's, uh, that's a very important question. I, um, I don't know how well I've been processing it, right? Um, I think um, a lot of people, when they think about racism, um, you know, they think of somebody being mean to you or, you know, someone saying, you know, the N-word or whatever. And yes, that is racism, but a lot of the racism that we see in the United States uh, is really structural, you know, it's, it's covert, it's institutional. Uh, you may not even see it as racism when it's happening, right? right. It, you may only understand it as racism sort of later on in your life. And so I think it's super important um, to sort of couch it in that. Um, and, you know, as somebody who, you know, very fortunate to have uh, grown up in an incredibly diverse city, um, but also aware of even the systemic injustices that we have here, um, you know, processing what's going on, um, you know, I, I really call myself an impatient optimist. Uh, at the end of the day, I really try to be forward looking, um, but I can't lie. You know, I think what's going on right now is incredibly frustrating. Um, you have essentially two pandemics in one, right? You have, uh, you know, the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, and then you also have um, racism, right? And uh, when it comes to racism, at least, this is a 400 year old pandemic that we choose to continuously ignore in the United States. Uh, we have a cure for it. We have the policies for it. We have the ideas that will, uh, you know, really make us into an equitable society, but we continuously refuse to um, to meet the moment. And so uh, for me, frustrated, angry, uh, sad, um, I think um, sometimes, you know, there's a feeling of deflation. Um, you know, you see we are, you know, constantly drinking from a fire hose, right? It feels like, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, um, I really feel like sometimes we're just living in some crazy movie, uh, but uh, 
Uh, I don't even think Hollywood could script what's going on right now. <laughs> it's that crazy. Um, and so, uh, but also, and I'll end with this, uh, my optimism, my impatient optimism, my stubborn optimism comes from the fact that over 400 years, uh, we indeed have moved forward. Um, although we feel and we are indeed taking several steps back almost every day, uh, we have moved forward. Uh, you know, I have one shirt uh, that says, you know, I am my ancestors as well as dreams. And I think for, for many Black Americans that that is truly the case, you know, uh, you know just looking, uh, you know, five, six decades ago uh, when we did not have the right to vote and, and the importance of voting now, hence the T-shirt that I'm wearing, Black Votes Matter, um, you know, we, we are in places. You see what happened in Ferguson, Missouri, Ferguson, uh, Missouri just earlier this week, uh, where they elected uh, their first Black and their first female mayor. Um, so, you know, I, I choose to remain optimistic uh, because I really don't have any other choice. Right, right. And I love how you just um, kind of opened up us up into our, our line of questioning when we talk about these issues of policies, because right now we're in the, in the midst of protesting. And now at this point, all cops that have been involved in the murder of George Floyd have been arrested and charged. Um, you know, so and I was texting a couple of my friends. I was like, man, I'm relieved, but I don't know why I should, but I should be relieved. Like this should shouldn't even have happened. You know, uh, as soon as this incident have ha should happened, it should have been an arrest on, on site. Uh, but, you know, at least, you know, we're moving in a certain direction. So, uh, you know, right now with these cops that have been arrested and charged, you know, people have been protesting up to this point and continue to protest. What is our responsibility and what we should be doing within this moment in time? I think first and foremost that uh, it is really because of these protests that we're seeing, uh, you know, rather swift action be taken uh, with this case, right? Uh, you know, um, I actually, uh, I know Keith Ellison, uh, the Attorney General of Minnesota, he is phenomenal. Uh, and uh, I, that he is now in charge of this case gives me real peace of mind. Um, I think that he knows exactly what he's doing. I know that he knows what he's doing and, and is going to be able to really look at this equitably, right? Uh, you know, we, we, we've, seen, we've seen this story be played out before where, you know, there are juries that end up being all white or end up acquitting the officer or whatever. So I mean, like, yeah, they've been arrested, they've been, you know, uh, they've been charged, but, but there is still a long road ahead of us, right? Like, you know, we have to go through jury selection. I mean, there, there's so many pieces to the, to, the, to the judicial process that we still have to uncover. And so um, I'm cautiously optimistic, you know, uh, even with Keith Ellison there, I know that he is still fighting uh, a system, right? I mean, the, the criminal injustice system that we have in the United States uh, is really what people like him and others are trying to fight. And so uh, I do want to also just give a shout out, uh, a friend of mine, State Representative China Tyler from uh, Massachusetts is on, um, is watching as well. And so I think, uh, you know, just in terms of like, what do you think we can be doing? Um, I really think, you know, we should be uh, doing several things. One is we should be electing more black people into office. Uh, not just any black person, right? Because not all skin folk are kin folk. We know that, right? Uh, you know, shout out to Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, who is a U.S. senator, a Republican, and a black man. I think that's an oxymoron. Um, and, you know, we have folks like him. So, you know, we, we need to realize that, you know, you need to be black, but you need to also be aligned with our views. Uh, and so we should be electing more black people. We should be getting more black people to be staffers in government and um, in political campaigns and, you know, be the strategists of these campaigns. Uh, and we should also uh, really understand the power that we have. I mean, if voting and if uh, social activism was not as powerful as it really is, then Republicans and, and, and white supremacists would not be fighting this power so much. I mean, there's a reason why the, the president of the United States uh, basically declared war on Americans this week. Um, you know, it's because he knows the power that we have. And so I don't think we should ever resign that fact. Um, and, and we should really be intentional about how we use that. So I think the protests um, have been enormously effective. It is why we're seeing these charges. Uh, I mean, think of Ahmaud Arbery. I mean, how long was that? Uh, I think 70, 80 days ago. And there's still, you know, there is movement, but not so much. And I mean, how many prosecutors have fumbled the process? Um, and it's only because there's been national outrage. I'm personally, Nate, I'm, I'm waiting for the outrage over Breonna Taylor's murder. I'm waiting for that to start uh, because uh, that one really hit home. Uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, there isn't uh, a dramatic video of, of Breonna Taylor being murdered like we saw with, 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 with George Floyd. So, uh, you know, at least with, with, with him, we, we were able to, you know, really 
be hurt, visibly be hurt uh, by watching that. Uh, I will say I have, a, I have a policy. I don't watch these videos. Uh, the last one I saw was Eric Garner in New York. And after that, I uh, it just it, it does not do good uh, for me. And, and I think we need to, you know, uh, be aware of that for some folks who just can't watch these videos. Yeah, I agree. I think the advancement of, of, of technology has definitely been able to put a microscope on the racism and racial injustices that continue to happen in this country. So it's not like racism has increased. Um, you know, it's always been there, but it's just the advancement of videos now and putting um, systems, you know, that it has, it has, you know, it's, it's allowed us to be a little, hold a little more accountability and weight to our voice. Um, even if we still have a long way to go, it's important that we're utilizing these devices to, you know, continue the path forward. Um, as you were saying as well, it's, it's a lot of information. I'm glad that you don't, that you're very self-aware and that you don't watch too many of these videos because it does affect me as well. And I was telling my friends, you know, this past week that there's only so much information that I can receive a day uh, to a point where I don't feel that our human minds um, have the capacity to process the information that we have access to as fast as it comes. Yeah. And, you know, so even with me, I won't have my TV on for throughout the day. I may check social here and there um, outside of the, the things that I'm working on and, and, and doing and highlighting, but it's difficult to kind of balance being a consumer and being a producer yeah. of, of content and, and, and things of that nature. But uh, one thing that I wanted to kind of talk to you, one thing that's very unique about us is that we have a, a connection to Africa with our families, you know, specifically Ethiopia. My family's from Ethiopia and Eritrea, but I was born here in the States. Now, the relationship between African immigrants and Afri uh, African immigrants, African diasporas, and African Americans have always been unique. Uh, though they share, they're, we share similar paths, we have very uh, distinctive differences in history, um, you know, with, with, with certain things that have taken place. You know, what is the proper approach that you feel African immigrants and African diasporas can take in uh, gathering a solidarity around African Americans during this time? Yeah, um, this is um, an incredibly frustrating topic uh, because, um, you know, quite frankly, had it not been for uh, African Americans enduring 400 years of insanity and hatred and enslavement, you and I would not be here. We would not be able to thrive in this country, right? I mean, it just the basic things that we take for granted, like opening a bank account, uh, being able to freely move across the United States, right? Uh, to be able to travel from Texas to Massachusetts to California, et cetera, to be able to sit anywhere you want on a bus or to eat anywhere you want in a restaurant or to be able to go to any school that you want to go to. Um, you know, it is because of people who literally died. I know we know all the, you know, the, the big ones, right? W.B. Du Bois and MLK and Rosa Parks and whatever, but, but there are millions of unnamed souls and many who died uh, in the Atlantic. I mean, let's be honest here, right? Uh, the Middle Passage. I mean, a lot of people died on that commute, right? And, and so there were people who were abducted and who were enslaved, but they tried to make something of themselves here in the United States and, have, and, and really against all odds have been a resilient people and have been uh, people who have really thrived in the face of hatred and in the face of prejudice. So I think, you know, almost you know my, my my gut reaction is like how dare you right like how dare you not appreciate this history um you know the history between ethiopians and african americans actually is really interesting uh you know a lot of people don't know this but um the first ethiopians arrived in the united states as merchants in 1808 they came here to do business you know a lot of people see us as having been refugees that came here in the 1980s and, and 90s uh, but but no i mean we were here as early as 1808 uh in new york harbor uh, uh, merchants arrived and, and they were here to do business. And uh, if you uh, know the history of the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, New York, uh, the Abyssinian Baptist Church was co-founded by those Ethiopians and by free African-Americans who were in New York. Um, and uh, they realized that it wasn't enough to worship in segregated churches, uh, that, uh, that God sees no race, God sees no identity, and, and we're all children of God, really. And so um, they they formed the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem with that mission, right? And over 200 years later, it still stays today. Uh, not to mention during World War II, when, when Italy uh, invaded Ethiopia and, and tried to colonize the country, African-Americans were lining up in Harlem 
and in D.C. at Howard University, literally giving up their American citizenship so that they can fight in the Ethiopian army, right? Um, uh, and so there is two centuries of history between Ethiopians and African Americans um, that, that I don't think a lot of us understand, appreciate, or know. Um, and I think that that's really where the tragedy lies. Like, I'm a student of history. I love history. Um, and, and I think that we need to really appreciate, uh, you know, how we've been able to come here and thrive. Um, we, in many ways, and, you know, I'll dare to say this, and I know I'm going to get pushed back through this, but in many ways, we African immigrants perpetuate white supremacy in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that that's an important very sensitive topic that we need to uncover in the weeks and months ahead and really crack open because, um, I mean, just, you know, humor me for a second. You know, have you ever dated uh, an African-American? Yeah, I have actually. Yeah, okay, what, what was the family's reaction? Like, I hope it was positive, but like, not to put you on the spot, but I mean, a lot of our people sort of freak out at that, right? I mean, like, we, we, we have these perceptions, we have these, we have these uh, views and stereotypes that we perpetuate African Americans as being um, whatever, and, and that's just not true, right? We're, we're really, in many ways, perpetuating this, these stereotypes. Um, and I think we just have to understand that we are here because of them. Uh, we thrive because of them. Uh, we are fortunate in many ways we don't have the, the, we have not socialized and internalized the oppression right. that they have, right. uh, but in many ways we have our own that we, that we have to grapple with, right? And so I think um, to be nuanced about this and to be really aware of history is super important. And, and uh, I, you know, at the end of the day, ultimately, when you're walking down the street, you're black. Right. And, and, and we have to own it. And we have to be proud about it. So I like to tell people, you know, I'm an African-American of Ethiopian origin. Uh, you know, I claim it. I own it. Uh, it's something that I really believe in. Uh, I feel very comfortable and I feel at home with African-Americans as, as equally as I do with uh, Ethiopians. Right, right. So when we're looking at right now with what we're dealing with, with the, uh, the protests, and I think this is kind of the crux of our conversation and looking at how do we turn the demands of the protests into long lasting, sustainable change? Uh, yeah. with civic engagement, which I feel like that's kind of down your lane. What are you seeing right now uh, for us moving forward? Yeah, um, you know, th there's a spectrum of civic engagement, right? There is no right way to do it, right? When you think of civic engagement, what is civic engagement? Civic engagement is is finding opportunities to improve your community. I mean, at the at the crux, right? And so protesting is is an important way of doing that. Um, but there are other ways, right? Uh, you can run for office, you can uh, volunteer your time, you can uh, work with an organization, you can, you know, you can register people to vote, um, you can mobilize your, your faith-based organization, your community. And so, you know, there are a variety of ways. And so I think um, what we have to do is really couch this as part of that spectrum. It's, it, it is important to protest um, because it is quite literally uh, the reason why these cops have been arrested. Uh, but that's not where we should stop, right? Like going to a protest is great, but don't just say, okay, hoorah, we, we stuck it to the cops and now we're back home. Well, what's next, right? Um, I love the, the TV show, The West Wing. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't know if you've uh, seen The West Wing, but President Bartlett in uh, the TV show um, always uh, has this line where he's like, what's next, what's next, right? And so I think that's the way we should be thinking as forward looking. And and so, you know, there are a number of elections that are happening this year at all levels that we should be part of, we should be aware of, right? I think it's really important that we, that we really think strategically about how do we, um, first and foremost, what are our priorities? We need to articulate those, right? Like what are the three to five things that we want right now? Uh, is it, do you want to defund police departments and demilitarize police departments? Great. Do you want increased investments for affordable housing? Great. Do you want um, you know, to bridge the digital divide so that, um, you know, especially now with the pandemic, everybody's doing online learning, but a lot of students don't have broadband access or even the, the, the hardware to, to, to learn. Um, whatever your issues are, clearly articulate them. And then depending on what those issues are, um, you know, some of these may be city issues or state issues or federal issues. And so depending on what those issues are, you're going to need to identify who the decision makers are, right? Who are the key people that you should be targeting? Um, and then really start reaching out to them, right? Uh, you know, there are certain issues that my member of Congress, Ayanna Presley, uh, has jurisdiction over that I can talk to her about. I'm not going to talk about my local, I'm not going to talk about foreign policy with my local city councilor, right? I can talk about that with Representative Presley. And so I think it's just important to understand what are our priorities as Black people in America? 
Um, and then again, going back to your previous question, we need to really um, embrace our shared blackness um, and understand that our issues are the larger black agenda issues, right? Like I, we, we're all in this together. You know, there's no difference between Ethiopians, Africans, African Americans, Afro Caribbean, whatever. At the end of the day, we're all black. We're here in America. Uh, we're in this boat together, and we and we can either sink or swim together. So I, I really think it's important for us to to couch it in that larger black agenda, um, because there are a lot of really great black movements that are out there, um, and 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 amazing organizations that are established, and and that we should be part of instead of you know just doing our own thing sometimes. Yeah, and I think so many times, especially with um, when we look, we talk about having a pro-black agenda, um, some people take it as, a, as an anti-white agenda, which is, yeah. which is not true. You know, it, there, are, yeah. there, are, there are communities that, you know, there are people in communities that can be able to vote and, and, and push for uh, legislation and, and different things that affect your community. And that's very important that you are uh, registered to vote, that you are, uh, your voice is heard and that because if you're not represented, then you're not going to be able to have certain things that can be able to really support you, you know, within yeah. your own communities and how you live and how you approach life. So I think that's very important uh, to be able to look at, to look at that. Now let's scale it down to kind of looking at what's happening right now with the police brutality and the, um, and you know, the black communities and the protesting. So would you say that right now looking at local government would be conducive to kind of help alleviate some of the agendas that you're that that may be at hand right now um you know what what would you say would be the proper direction that we must take in order to really make uh, effective change um you know with the local government i think local government uh you know so i i ran for cambridge uh city council cambridge massachusetts in uh 2017 and and the reason why i uh, I ran was because uh, local government is where you can really have the most direct immediate impact on the lives of constituents. The most immediate. I mean, the president of the United States, no matter who that person is, is not going to be able to fix your pothole. The president of the United States does not oversee parks and recreation, right? I mean, let's be honest here. Um, even, you know, Betsy DeVos as the secretary of education, those education curriculum is set at the local level with um, with school committees and school boards, you know. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education really oversees major uh, high-level issues like education, civil rights matters, and whatnot. And so I think it's important to understand police departments, law enforcement, a lot of that is overseen at the local, county, or state level, depending on how your how your state is governed. Um, and, and so it's important that we understand um, that, uh, you know, I think, you know, the president, President Obama, my, my forever president, Barack Hussein Obama, the second, and, and others have, have correctly articulated, you know, um, a budget is a statement of your values. And so one of the things that we should be doing, and this isn't just for government either, uh, nonprofit, uh, corporations, whatever. I mean, a budget is a reflection of your values. You cannot tell me that equity is too expensive. You have to look at your budget and, and show me what you're doing. I don't care that you say Black Lives Matter. Frankly, that doesn't mean anything to me. I want to know what your policies are. And so thinking about uh, budgets, you know, there's an initiative right now in uh, the city of Los Angeles to uh, defund uh, the police department. Uh, I think by 40% that they're advocating for there. And so even with the militarization of police departments, uh, Nate, when you look at that, um, a lot of these police departments benefit from a program with the United States Department of Defense where they get surplus military equipment. I mean, this stuff is meant for war. You know, like this is not meant for regular civilian oversight like this is i mean that that police departments are even signing on to collect military equipment from the department of defense i mean for me that is just outrageous it, it, it is beyond understanding and so i think you know we need to couch it in this we need to be looking at the line item budgets of police departments across the country and then also to the larger point of prosecutors again to bring it back to that prosecutors, district attorneys, attorneys general have a lot of leeway, right? I mean, a district attorney can decide if a crime was even uh, committed to begin with, right? And so uh, in, in, in Suffolk County, in, in the city of Boston and its immediate uh, surrounding cities, uh, Suffolk County residents in 2018 voted for a new district attorney. 
uh, Rachel Rollins, uh, the outgoing one uh, was retiring. And uh, Rachel Rollins is part of this new breed of uh, DAs across the country who are dynamic, who are progressive and unapologetic about it. And uh, she has been very intentional about making sure that justice is at the center of of her administration. And so we need to be thinking about what are the laws that we have at the state and local level that govern policing, that govern um, the criminal justice system, and how do we fix that, right? I mean, district attorneys have a lot of power, but we also need to give them the tools so that they can start to reform the system as well. And frankly, if, if these people don't reflect our values, we got to vote them out. Like, we can't just wait, right? I, I often say that an election at the end of the day is a job interview. You're either hired or fired, you know? That's when the Human Resources Department convenes on <laughs> November 3rd, and we are the Human Resources Department. We, we get to decide whether or not we want to keep them in the White House. And so uh, it's really important, you know, at the local level that we really think about um, our police budgets and, and, and go around um, uh, to really getting folks to do that. I mean, I would love at these protests, man, if they were able to give out uh, copies of their municipal budgets to everybody and say, this is what the police budget looks like. Uh, this is what we spend on policing versus what we spend on education versus what we spend on human services versus what we spend on uh, public health, right? I mean, I think at the core of it too, and you know this, a lot of the functions of police officers uh, uh, in many cities, not all, but in many cities, uh, they are expected to be social workers, they are expected to be nurses, they are expected to do a lot of other things that are beyond the traditional scope of law enforcement. Um, and so I think it's really important that we think about that and say, look, like, let's take that money away from a police department and actually bring that into public health or into human services and say, okay, we need more social workers and less people with a firearm. What are some helpful resources that people can get a little more engaged within voting and knowing dates and so forth? You know, can you give any like practical tools or websites or ways that that process works for people that may be watching, looking to get involved? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there, there are a lot of different organizations out there that are doing phenomenal work. Uh, obviously, you know, I'm a member of the NAACP. Uh, the NAACP is one of the I mean, you know, this is one of the foremost civil rights organizations in this country. Um, you know, uh, Color of Change is, is an amazing online uh, racial justice organization that I would strongly urge everybody to look at. Uh, Color of Change has a lot of uh, really cool uh, social action um, and uh, uh, they have a lot of like very tangible action steps. Uh, the Obama Foundation actually put out a really cool uh, toolkit uh, that was part of President Obama's Medium uh, article earlier this week. So I would definitely look at the Obama Foundation, My Brother's Keeper, for sure, as part of uh, that, that foundation. Um, and then also sort of, you know, on a local level, um, I believe in local civic engagement. So you, you know, I, I think uh, folks on this um, uh, watching should really think about, you know, what are the, the structures in your area? Is there a local Democratic Party that you should be part of? Uh, you know, I think we like to complain a lot about the Democratic Party, rightfully so. I have a love-hate relationship with the Democratic Party. But the best way to influence it is to really, in my opinion, work from the inside. Get elected. Join your state committee, right? Join your uh, your city or town committee. If there's a ward committee, join your ward committee, right? And so uh, you should be part of your Democratic structure uh, and, and get elected and help pass uh, resolutions and decisions that reflect you and our values. And so I would definitely suggest people to, to really uh, think about how can they embed themselves into these structures. Um, and also, not a lot of these things take a lot of time. You know, uh, it's not like, the, like it's time intensive or something either. Um, you know, and so I would really suggest people look at these sorts of um, uh, t uh, tactics. Uh, I mean, aside from that, also, uh, I like to write. Uh, I process heavily by writing. Uh, and so, um, you know, if you like to write, you know, think about setting up a blog or setting up a Twitter account or write for your local newspaper, you know, uh, talk to the editors there and, you know, they may be able to run an op-ed that you write uh, about a particular issue that, you know, uh, obviously a really good op-ed is one that has a provocative idea that is well-researched. And so think about uh, that as another way for those of you that like to write, um, getting in touch with your local newspaper and, and writing an op-ed about uh, Black Lives and, and how uh, we shouldn't just say that they matter, but that we should show it, right? Right. Something that I've, I've been thinking about, and we're, we have about 20 more minutes, I believe, within this session, so I want to make sure I get this question in for families and people that are raising children that are Black, um, black families. You know, what are, uh, how do you talk about racism to children? Uh, this, this just seems like something that 
you know, if you grew up in a white family, you probably never really had to talk about getting pulled over by the cops. Um, you know, where, you know, in a black family, that's probably one of the biggest conversations, you know, how you approach police or how, what you do when police approach you and how you interact in schools. And it's, it's very complex, but how do you, yeah. what are some ways that you think in your opinion that we should be having these type of conversations with the next generation? Yeah, um, I will not presume to know uh, what it is to raise children. I do not have any. Um, I, I think that uh, part of it, I mean, you know, and I wrote about this in my blog uh, post earlier this week that, you know, racism is truly learned, right? Bigotry is learned. Uh, it's not like you are born and you're like, I hate black people. That's not how it works. And so um, uh, I, I think one of the things that we need to do is really um, introduce people at a younger age to civic engagement. Um, I know that that is one of the things that was uh, commented um, here is, you know, uh, wherever it's safe and wherever it's possible, taking young people to civic actions, whether it's a protest or phone banking, if you're phone banking for a candidate, or if you're doing a house party for a candidate or a letter writing campaign or whatever, or even, you know, my favorite is taking children to uh, vote. You know, when you go vote at a polling center, take your kids with you or take, you know, whatever with you. Uh, when someone turns 18, get them registered to vote. You know, in certain states, you can pre-register people at the age of 16. Pre-register people to vote. You know, um, uh, I will, uh, I, I, I think uh, he's watching, but uh, I, I, my, my godsons, I love them to death. And when they turned 18, I swear to God, uh, for their birthday, my gift to them was voter registration forms. I had them <laughs> fill it crazy. out. I had them fill it out at the restaurant. People thought I was crazy. Uh, literally, the whole table looked at me. It was so funny. And and I was like, nope, we're doing this. And, and they're like, for real? And I was like, yes, you are registering to vote. And I will personally submit it to uh, uh, the City of Boston Election Commission, right? And so, like, uh, I think, like, these are the sorts of things that we should be encouraging. Uh, we should we should sort of hold each other accountable. You know, do a phone tree. Like, you know, a, a lot of uh, friends uh, of mine, they will text me a few days before Election Day saying, like, you know, Sam, who should I vote for? Whatever. And so it provides me an opportunity. Like, usually now I just have a a thing that I copy and paste and send to everybody where I'm like, okay, like this is your slate. You know, this is who I'm recommending. This is who I'm endorsing. Uh, and so I think really uh, thinking about, you know, how do we get young people involved at a younger age uh, when it comes to, um, when it comes to, uh, you know, hate and, and solidarity, uh, I think really uh, part of it is also exposing people to other types of people. Uh, I think, uh, you know, as a human thing, we fear what we don't know, right? right. Uh, we fear what we don't know. We are afraid of the other. Uh, and quite frankly, for a lot of white people in this country, they haven't really interacted with black people. I mean, when I was an undergrad, I had friends of mine who said, you know what, Sam, you're the first black person that I'm actually friends with. And, and, you know, for me as an extrovert, I saw that as an opportunity to, to, um, to sort of, you know, break barriers and to create understanding. Uh, but that's not the responsibility of black people, right? Like we should not, we should not expect that young, that, that black people are gonna be the ambassadors of the race, right? That's ridiculous. And so um, I, I would say definitely exposing uh, uh, your children uh, and, and other young people that in your life to um, diversity, uh, whether it's in school or out of school, making sure that they are well-versed and, and cultured, making sure that they go to libraries, right? Libraries are free, they're public. Um, and then also, I just want to put in a plug uh, on uh, uh, Saturday, uh, in two days, uh, Sesame Street and CNN are doing a town hall for children oh. on racism. And so uh, the Sesame Workshop, which you know, owns Sesame Street, uh, is a phenomenal organization. I mean, a lot of us just know them for Sesame Street, but they do a lot of other stuff internationally. And, and they are holding a dynamic, awesome uh, town hall uh, for children on Saturday. I, I unfortunately will, will not be able to join it, but if you have the ability, anybody that's listening in on this, uh, please watch it. it it's gonna, I believe it's at 10 a.m. Eastern time on Saturday. That's great. Thank you for adding that. That's phenomenal. I'm so glad that we're yeah. reaching younger children uh, through that format on ways that they approach these huge issues, you know? Um, that's, that's amazing. So at this time, I think we're about 16 minutes, I'm guessing 15 minutes. I wanna make sure that we open up the floor for people to ask questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to start adding comments and we'll go ahead and have that discussion. Uh, one person, I think this is Dan 65 says, what does your organization do to help our children learn about civic engagement and activism. 
Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, Generation Citizen is a national organization. It's uh, been around for a decade. Uh, and uh, we have a curriculum called Action Civics. Uh, it's experiential uh, learning. So students learn civics by doing it. And this curriculum is embedded in classrooms across the country. Uh, we have our footprint is in about a dozen states. We do heavy programming in six of them. So California, Texas, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, New York, and Massachusetts. So we're not just in you know the blue progressive areas. Um, and for us, uh, our belief is uh, you want to completely transform the way that civics is taught in public schools in America. Our target are middle school and high school students, making sure that they have the tools, the understanding, the skills, the knowledge, and the motivation, right? The disposition, the psychological belief that they have an ability to change. And so this isn't an after school program or whatever. Um, it's usually a history teacher or a civics teacher, if there's a civics teacher that would deliver this curriculum. And over the course of a semester, students choose topics in their communities that are important to them. Uh, and they spent class time researching the issue and coming up with a policy goal. It's not a public awareness campaign. There has to be a policy goal, right? So we've had students that have successfully advocated to increase mental health funding in their schools. We've had students that have successfully uh, advocated uh, for plastic bags and styrofoam to be banned from their cities. We have had students that have gone to, uh, you know, Massachusetts, uh, some of our students went to the state house to testify on uh, anti-vaping legislation, right? Uh, vaping obviously is a big issue among, among uh, young folks. And so they were there to testify against vaping. And so, um, you know, these students are gaining what we call the civic skills, civic knowledge, and then civic disposition, civic motivation. Um, and uh, the, the ultimate goal is to equip the next generation of Americans with these, the, these important attributes. And, and these are the future voters. These are the future office holders. These are the future uh, folks that are gonna be in finance and in medicine and in business. And we wanna make sure that they have the understanding and the ability to actually impact change. So, um, I mean, Generation Citizens work is phenomenal. Uh, I work in our Massachusetts site um, uh, where I lead policy advocacy, strategic partnerships and uh, fund development. Awesome. Uh, the, w one other question that we do have is uh, they say, thank you. This is uh, Bookie Justin. Thank you for being here uh, today. What are you both doing for your own self-care? Thank you so much. Yeah. Great. Great question. You want to take that first or you want me to take that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, man. Self-care. <laughs> That's a, you know, I am the ambassador of everything that is not self-care. So do <laughs> not like <laughs> self-care, man. Uh, you know, um, I, I for me, uh, knowledge is sanity. So you know how you said that you sort of tune out sometimes from the news? Like, I can't do that. Like, I, I need to always be um, aware of what's going on. And I think like it just it freaks me out, to be honest, like sort of what goes on. Um, and, but I think I process things when I'm fully aware of what's going on. And, and I love to really dive deep on issues. And so I find myself spending hours looking at articles and, and you know, reading scholarly journals and, and whatever to really sort of understand an issue. Um, and I have a lot of friends that I sort of just text and have a lot of conversations with um, to sort of everything I can't tweet, I send them. <laughs> so there's that. Um, and then, uh, you know, honestly, like one of the upsides to staying home over the last several weeks is, um, you know, you just you don't have to dress up every day and uh, you know it just you're sort of casual um i can't believe i'm saying this but i think i've gotten sick of netflix and hulu and so there's that um it's just there's only so much tv you can watch um uh but you know i think uh you know again i'll just go back to what i said earlier i'll reiterate i i, I do i have this policy of not watching those uh, police brutality videos and and that's quite intentional because when i used to uh, before Eric Garner, um, it would really get to me. And so uh, that policy of no watching uh, is, is something that I strictly adhere to. Yeah. How about you? What do you do? Yeah, also, I, think... I drink a lot of coffee, so there's, there's, there's that. Just to <laughs> plug in again. The, the plug, zero, the plug, you know? the um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think for me, the way I think yeah. self-care is found in self-awareness. Yeah. And yeah. I, that's what I've been learning more about um, as I've been able to kind of take care of myself. One, it's I control the information that I'm intaking every day. 
Uh, I'll turn the TV off. I may give myself one hour a day to really look at um, certain things that I've missed, you know, and yeah. so I may seek information out maybe one hour out of the day. I work out, I pray, um, I, um, I get in group chats with friends that from child, with childhood friends that I'm just very familiar yeah. with. And we talk about things that are happening without any filters. So we get a chance to yeah. kind of like exhaust you know, our feelings and our thoughts, and quite frankly, talking about things that are just nonsense and just mm -hmm. laughing about different memes. I love that. I love <laughs> that. <laughs> it's it's yeah. the best when you can, you know, just talk to someone yeah. without really thinking too much, um, yeah. you know, how to articulate what you're trying to say, but just people that just know you and yeah. get you. Yeah. I yeah. think that's been, community has been healing for me. So I look yeah. for those type of uh, people within my community that can just, trust i can kick my feet up with and and just really be able to just dive into unfiltered conversations with so that helps me a lot um yeah. also what if i am watching or taking in information i'm making sure it's something that is a positive representation of of who i am and or who i'm yeah. striving to be so i'll watch inspiring documentaries or i'll watch great movies or listen to great music that's you know just changes my mood uh, yeah. going for walks, uh, getting myself out of my own working home environment, you know, so there is a multitude of things, but I think it always goes back to uh, self care is found within self awareness. Yeah, yeah. You gave a far better answer than me. Uh, just, I, I think I undersold myself for the record. I do some of the things that you mentioned. Um, but but I, I'll say one of the things that I started during the pandemic was um, uh, I have this uh, weekly uh, group uh, that uh, we, we have lunch, virtual lunch every Wednesday. Um, and uh, it's uh, fellow uh, black people that are interested in politics. And we just, we get together and it is an hour of complete unstructured time. It is funny. It is absolutely funny. Um, because to your point, you know, one of my, my strong beliefs is never, ever, ever take yourself so seriously. Like, just don't. Like, it is, life is way too short. And so, um, you know, I like 99% of the time, I'm facetious. I like, you know, it is <laughs> the things I say sometimes, but like it is really just about having fun in the moment and finding joy. You know, um, you know, we, we really have to, uh, especially in these tough moments, find joy, however that is. Is that going out to a restaurant and having good food? Is that traveling? Like I love to travel, you know, uh, right before the pandemic, I was in Miami for four days. That was fun. Like, so it's find joy, however you find it right. uh, and, and do it. So to your point, I think self-awareness is important in understanding what are your boundaries? Like what, what are your triggers? What gets you? And don't do that. Right. Right. I yeah. agree. I agree 100%. Yeah. Uh, this may be our yeah. last question because I know we're running out of time and we'll probably have closing remarks, but what are some of your best yeah. practices about highlighting and discussing race within an organization where the staff and leadership are majority white? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, and so, uh, and hopefully we can try to fit in one or two more questions. I'll be very brief. Yeah. Um, a few things that come to mind. If you work for a, a company or a nonprofit, uh, particularly, but even government, uh, again, look at their budget, uh, look at who they're spending money with, um, you know, uh, are, are the vendors that you choose, right? Your consultants and the people who do your printing and whatever, are these union shops, you know, are these women owned, black owned, LGBT owned, like whatever, right? Like think about sort of where is, again, your budget is a reflection of your values. So where is that money being spent? Uh, don't feel afraid to make people uncomfortable. I mean, racism is uncomfortable. Sexism is uncomfortable too. I mean, we're both men uh, and, and, and having these conversations around sexism when you, whether or not we ask for it, we benefit from patriarchy. Uh, so these conversations are indeed uh, uncomfortable, but don't be afraid to have them. Um, definitely form affinity groups. I think those are very important. I think where people can come together as black people and people of color and women and others. I, I think, you know, having uh, some sort of affinity group or caucus or whatever within your workplace uh, provides solidarity. Mm -hmm. So it's not just you. Uh, if it's just you, then obviously that, that's a lot more challenging. Um, but I think, you know, uh, the other uh, place where I think there's a lot of traction, obviously, is around hiring practices, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, there are a lot of really cool new ways to, to hire people where you sort of strip any identifying information, like their name or whatever, uh, anything that sort of can, can um, uh, inspire bias, if you will. And so thinking about uh, that, making sure, you know, do you have the ability to sit on a hiring committee? 
instance. If you do, you should join it, right? And so uh, I've, I've sat on several hiring committees over the years, and, and it's really awesome, just even for your own personal development, being on the other side of, of the hiring process. And so uh, I, I think, you know, being very intentional about it. Um, and then again, I would say, if you're going to come up with criticism or with uh, ways to improve, um, you know, come up with a list, like be prepared with very specific uh, ways. Um, I like to see problems as opportunities. So don't just, you know, uh, state these are the things that are wrong here, but really to state these are the things that I'd like us to improve, right? Look at it from a sort of asset-based, um, uh, strength-based uh, perspective. Um, so, you know, those are some things that I would suggest um, to, to look at. Yeah, I think also, and just to even add on to that, uh, one thing I want to be clear, and especially with, uh, you know, people that are black within, you know, black communities, that we aren't responsible to educate, uh, you know, people on racism and racial injustice. It's, it's one thing, it's, it's already difficult just living it and experiencing it. But again, if you do have the capacity, you know, feel, you know, more than, you know, welcome to do that, do so. But I also think uh, whether you're white or black, or you're talking race relations or racism, though I, it's very uncomfortable, I think change happens at the speed of trust. So I think before you talk about any type of life-changing or meaningful conversations around things that are controversial, I think it's important to be able to establish trust through relationship building. I remember mm -hmm. one conversation that I had with a good friend, um, you know, it was my, one of my white brothers, really good friend of mine. Uh, he couldn't really uh, see uh, the, um, the significance of Black Lives Matter. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't think any, I didn't see anything wrong with that. He just didn't have you know much education about it and he was making his own assumptions based off of maybe um a media outlet that he subscribed to so one question that i did ask him though that i remember it's being very pivotal within our relationship in general was i asked him i said how many black friends do you have and then he mm -hmm. literally just couldn't answer he says you and he was like maybe this one person at church but i only get a chance to talk to him maybe after service yeah. is over really quick so i was like okay that's the issue uh, before we could talk about a lot of these controversial and uncomfortable conversations, let's work on building a relationship with people that have different views, uh, that are different races and ethnicities, so that we can develop a sense of empathy. And then once empathy is embedded within a relationship, it's easier to have these type of conversations. So I would say, whether you're in a work environment or an educational format or in church, wherever you are where there's a, a huge integration of people and population, I think it's important that we are able to be cognizant of getting ourselves uncomfortable and building uh, quality relations with people of all backgrounds so that we can have more educated conversations uh, that can be beneficial for who we are as a global community. And I think yeah. that's one thing that I do treasure from our relationship that we had together. I felt like I got a deeper understanding of his worldview and values, and he also got a, a better understanding of my worldview and values. And from there, it's our responsibility to take upon ourselves to dictate what we do with that information. because. At the end of the day, all we can do is educate. And yeah. every, each individual is uh, responsible for what they do with that education. So we have two minutes left. Uh, closing remarks from Samuel, really want to hear from you um, on next steps forward and how we create sustainable change from protests to uh, public policy. Yeah, um, thank you, thank you. I think that's a great way to end on relationship building. I think. You know, one of uh, the things that a lot of us in politics say all the time is if you're going to throw someone under the bus, right, whether it's in a uh, press conference or whether it's in a hearing or whatever, call them the day before, let them know. <laughs> and and so to your point, like I, I would, you know, for me, if I'm going to call you out on, on something publicly, it's because you've done something incredibly egregious. Otherwise, my preference is to take you aside and say, hey, you know, you may not be racist, but the thing you said was racist, right? And so um, to, to really help people identify their weakness areas. And generally, I mean, all of us, we are far more uh, receptive to feedback when someone's not coming for us, right? So like, let's just be uh, aware of that and sort of how we build relationships beyond just race either. Um, you know, again, I am an impatient optimist. I think over 400 years, Black people in the United States have gone through a lot. Um, but I will end with, in 2017, uh, I, uh, about a month after I lost my election, went down to Washington, D.C. for a few meetings. And uh, part of uh, my trip included visiting uh, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. 
uh, which I like to just refer to as the museum. And if you seconds. have, yeah, I think everybody should visit the museum. It starts in the basement with slavery. It's depressing. It's dark. It's deep. And you just go up and you go up and you go up. And as you go up, your heart lifts. And, and, and that's how I want people Four to seconds. see it. This is a relay race. Hey guys, thank you for listening. The show is powered by Ground Zero Coffee, an East African coffee company focused on community impact through storytelling and social enterprise. Ground Zero serves specialty grade and ethically traded coffee sourced from its place of origin, Ethiopia, and the greater East African regions. Ground Zero is committed to creating new narratives and closing the wealth gap within underrepresented communities worldwide through storytelling and social enterprise. Be sure to show your support and order your coffee from Ground Zero now at startfromgroundzero.com.